Today, we welcome Gordon White back to Skeptico. Gordon is, of course, the creator and host of the very excellent Room Soup blog and podcast, as well as the author of several really cool, interesting books. You see them there on the screen. Starships, The Chaos Protocols, and one other, what is it, Pieces of Eight? Is it? That's the one. That's the other one. He's been a popular guest on Skeptico, and I always look forward to welcoming Gordon back to talk about all sorts of goings-on. So, Gordon, welcome back to Skeptico. It's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back. Okay, I need to ask you a favor right off the bat. One of the things I think is really cool about Rune Soup, the podcast, is you have this opening question. And everyone knows this by now, but you ask people, were you a weird kid growing up? And I thought, wow, this is cool. I have to do some kind of question. So I started this question and I cannot get it right. So you're going to have to help me, coach me, show me how to do this. But here's the question that I guess I think is relevant to Skeptico. And I want to ask people and I want to find the right way to ask it. But I want to tune into the first experience people have with Knowing in kind of a sciency logic reason standpoint and how that can be transformative and also how knowing from a spiritual, if you will, uh, standpoint and how that can be profound. But maybe I'm just stretching it out there. It doesn't have the simplicity and the punch. I think um, not being a scientist, that one, maybe we would, because I think I'm, I know how I'm going to answer it. But maybe that needs to be rephrased to like, when did you first realize that we can um, learn things via uh, empiricism or reasoning? Like, when was your first like, oh, wow, I can actually do a thing and learn something as a result of it? And I guess for me, that one, um, we have a small um, crustacean um, in Australia called a yabby, and it's basically a small freshwater kind of like mini lobster. And... Um, as a child, I think because I had, um, I still have rural um, cousins and they had them in their dams and we had a couple of them that I sort of kept as pets for a while. So as a kid, maybe about five, I suddenly realized that you could, I was aware looking into this kind of fishbowl with these things and I could feed them certain stuff and keep them alive at different temperatures and, and have them grow. That there was a sequence of things that I could do to um, observe an, an organism. Um, the other one at about 12 or 13, I won a science award um, to do with like looking at peripheral vision. And that turned out to be a kind of op because it was, it was funded by a, um, <laughs> a, a chemical company, well, a, a, a hydrocarbon company. Uh, and they funded this sort of statewide competition um, for people to like design science experiments. And the, the, the winners got this really bizarre prize, which was you got to spend a three day weekend at essentially like a, a youth camp where you would, you visited a nuclear facility and the games that we would play had reps from the company there. And they were asking questions like, who would you invite to out of anyone in history? Who would you invite to dinner and like getting people to test like different, like little bo bottle rocket stuff. And I'm like, you guys are actually <laughs> eyeing off who yeah. you might actually want to pay for going to university. And I kind of worked that out at about 12 and I misbehaved. So they didn't pay for my university, but I'm like, this is odd. Like, I just, I just did a little science experiment at school and all of a sudden I have to spend three days with like oil company executives having them ask weird questions. So um, those are the two from a science perspective, but it, the one that sticks with me is the idea that you can, there, there's a body of knowledge that you can apply to keep an, an animal or whatever alive. Um, the spiritual one is, is easier and it's, it, I guess it stretches spiritual. I think this one would be good. This is a good question to ask people because mine would have been uh, sleep paralysis, hag attacks, um, which I would have had, I've had since I was about four. So it, uh, unbidden entity contact, some of which may or may not have been a screen memory of even weirder things. But I was a kid that that happened to. Um, so my first spiritual experience was... Um, not that pleasant, frankly. <laughs> and I had a sequence of them. And the science one, I think, if maybe if we talk about it, is when did you first realize you can use reason or you can reason out how we can know things about the world? Um, but those are my two answers. I like it. I like this is a very skeptical double question to start with. 
I really like the way you kind of are moving that. And it is because science part throws people. And I like the way you just kind of recast it there at the end, because I think that is the experience that I'm trying to tap into is that that idea that I can through reason have some control over things, even if it's just knowing and extrapolating from that, that I could know other things, you know what I mean? It, it's kind of like the first launching point to knowing more. And yeah. I think the spiritual thing is kind of interesting too, because I've always had a very uh, frightful kind of first experience that is kind of like a sleep paralysis thing, but it was kind of this, I forget the term for it, but it's like this, uh, when you feel your body is misshapen, you know, kind of like really in extreme, exaggerated kind of ways. And I remember experiencing that and going, whoa, what's going on? And it really kind of freaked me out. Were you a kid at the time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my sequence, so I had classic hag attacks where it would be sleep paralysis and I'd be sort of slowly become aware that there was an entity in the room that was waiting more or less at the door until I became aware of it. And then it would come right up close and, and I wouldn't be able to move and I couldn't open my eyes and it was right there. And it was clearly a, a thing that delighted in and was probably feeding off the fear. But the other thing that I think is potentially a screen memory has a, um, a body shape change to it. it. It starts off as sleep paralysis, but I would get microscopically small to mm. the point where um, the fabric of the bed sheets were thick as ship ropes and, was a, and there would be I had memories of um, and as a result so um, hypodermic needles became huge and I had a vision of like an experience of them really large needles being near me and then also a Romulan Dideridex class for the nerds out there um, warbird um, as as a thing that was there and this is uh, oh and um, and a figure that had a bee head so this quite clearly looks like some sort of screen memory of a thing. But it's interesting you mentioned the body shape um, change because I knew this particular one was coming on because I, I'd still have sleep paralysis, but my impression was I shrank to microscopic size. So you still have sleep paralysis, huh? No, I haven't. I, not since, actually oh. not since I found magic. But um, I have, uh, so they all kind of went away at about 13. And it's the, the thing about um However they work, the thing about simple house protection and, and sort of bedroom protection stuff that you find everywhere around the world is that they really do work and you really don't need any skill in it. Like you, you cause I was a kid and I'm reading out of these, you know, wicker books. Uh, and some and it, sage and, uh, and yeah. uh, kind of throw yeah. some salt around and, uh, yeah. And you, and, and I don't know what to tell you. It works, which rather suggests that however we, you know, use these terms or define them, um, a lot of whatever is going on is uh, mind, right? But um, yeah, it, it cleared up for me. That's one way to interpret it. I think that's, exactly. that's, really, that's really interesting. And maybe that leads us into kind of how I framed up our little talk today, because I heard you've done so many awesome interviews, but one that you did recently was uh, with our friend over at Forum Burialis, Al. And what I really liked about his interview is he went back to the Starships book, which I mm -hmm. think is, as much as it is appreciated by folks, I think it's underappreciated. And I think it had a couple of interesting little guideposts that I still follow. And I find myself quoting all the time on Skeptico. And one is this idea of the data versus the interpretation of the data. And it's a rather uh, simple idea with, profound application that winds up being fitting in, in so many more places than we usually talk about it. But maybe just explain to people, I always like how you talk about it in the, in the dig, because we can really understand the person who's digging is not the person, but go, go ahead and just explain yeah, what that means. Absolutely. So um, one of the things Nassim Taleb said in his most recent book that I really, really liked is um, you don't ask the carpenter who built the roulette wheel for gambling advice because it's not you they might have domain expertise over here but that's not necessarily a thing that doesn't imply that they have domain expertise in in something that happens to be separate or um even adjacent so when you uh, when you're talking about it from an archaeological perspective absolutely there is a skill set involved in in um, digging and cataloging and 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 doing the carbon 14 tests and all the other stuff that goes with actually um, generating data from a uh, archaeological project. What 
uh, how we interpret that data is a completely separate skill set. It is, it's philosophical. I mean, you can certain you might actually be good at both, but it doesn't necessarily follow that you would be. Another example I used in chaos protocols, which I like, is a dentist might be good at making money, but it doesn't necessarily follow that he or she would be good at keeping money. It is a diff different skill to generate money and, and to invest it. And we, we very often conflate these things. And the, when it comes to the kind of stuff that we talk about on our respective shows, um, we're both rather, I mean, I, my previous job was global data director. It's literally in my title. So I rather like data uh, and I rather like interpreting it. And I've spent a lot of time thinking with how data are generated and, uh, and what interpretive modes are, are the most useful and, and who has good ones and, and, and so on. So I, I really like, and I think if you focus on this, it does allow you to swim in some stranger waters this is a very chaos magic perspective, I suppose. It allows you to swim in some really strange waters because um, there are no data that aren't irrelevant. Um, it's just how you manage the kind of in and out and who you listen to and, and including yourself in that in terms of interpretation and data and so on. And I think it's a really good yardstick for um, digging into topic areas that are, I mean, you've got the ancient aliens picture on the screen here, digging into topic areas that might be kind of like low quality, if you will, um, but there is still quality in there. There are still good data, um, and, and it's looking at where, whether that interpretation that comes from, say, the Ancient Aliens program is, is the best one for looking at the anomalies that we do, in fact, find in history, and probably not, at least as described in that show. You know, let's talk about that for a minute. I think Ancient Aliens is a phenomenal show, and I think if we're just to apply the fair standard across the board in terms of how academia is dealing with the data versus how they're dealing with the data. To me, they're, they're heads and shoulders above. No matter how poorly they do it, they're so far ahead. You know, we did the interview together with uh, John Brandenburg, and I think mm -hmm. you, you did it, and we broadcast on Skeptico. He's on there all the time, and he's brilliant. I'm constantly watching him on there, and I'm going like, wow, this is super insightful. And not everyone they have on there is just as That's insightful. That's exactly right, and, yeah. And but back to your point, I think you know the the tricky thing, the the dirty little secret about the data versus interpretation. In my experience, is therein lies the the problem is the never ending interpretation filtering. There is no end point really into how far it can be interpreted. So it's almost like one of those axioms that we can never you know get past because we are constant. It's just a reminder that we are always interpreting and the interpretation is always open to change given when we find how those filters need to be changed. So uh, that, that, how, why don't you like ancient aliens? It's not, um, it's not that I don't like it. I think you have, uh, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so bouncing up and down the uh, historical record, looking for um, buildings that are impressive and saying aliens must have done that, whether it's India in the 1400s or whether it's Gobekli Tepe or whether it's the Maya or what have you, is insufficiently nuanced to um, take the discussion or the analysis or the interpretation to that next level. Now, I, my background is in... Uh, I have a background in, in multi-channel television, so I'm X Discovery Channel. Uh, and one of the problems is, one of the problems with multi-channel from a commercial perspective is they don't have very, they, they aim for evergreen programs. So they aim to, to build a program that is the same every time and is popular. And when I was at um, Discovery Channel, it was Deadly as Catch because it doesn't change. Every season, it's a bunch of guys on a boat with big waves and people loved it. And, and the trouble with a long running program like Ancient Aliens is exactly that. Um, the, the, the majority of the, the money that a multi-channel broadcaster makes is in long running programs that they can sell to other networks and so on, right? So Ancient Aliens is a victim of its own success, uh, which is it can't ever change because it's hit a formula <laughs> that allows people to watch it. And unfortunately that is where you get into variable levels of quality. Cause yes, Dr. Brandenburg's amazing. Um, I would suggest instead that people maybe read his book uh, and, and get like some, some pure John, uh, because I, I have friends who are, who've either been on it or um, turned down being on it or have been on it and going, I regret that. I'm not going to do that again. Uh, and it's largely because you sort of sit in front of a blue screen and you kind of have to, They'll arrange the question so you say a thing and get a sound bite that then they'll they'll kind of sequence. So it's you know it's an ambitious and 
obviously it's a very fascinating and valid area to cover. It's just whether a long running multi-channel program can deliver sufficient quality over time. And I don't think it can <laughs> is why. Okay. I, I, want to move on because I have so many other things I want to talk to you about, but I will not move on. I will persist. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I guess I'd, I'd push back on is your first point. I think the nail that they're pounding on is the correct nail. And given the mountain that they're, they're trying to climb, the, the, predominant view that they're up against and through, throughout academia, just and, and so pervasive that this couldn't possibly be true, and especially concerning how long-running the show is, yes, that we do need an alternative explanation for why the pyramids look the same as the pyramids over in Central America, and to the larger question is, why do keep people look up to the sky? You know, why is there that sure. instinct? Why do the Dogen tell us that you know, they, they, hey, they just tell you straight up. Yeah, we don't have any contact with the outside world because the Syrians came down however many hundreds, thousands of years ago and told us we're from the star people. I mean, to me, it's almost like they, they have to pound on the same nail because it does seem to be the best nail at the moment. It's, it's the really Occam's like razor kind of thing. It's the simplest, most parsimonious answer to the question of what was the inspiration for these ancient cultures to look up and to be fascinated with the stars and star gods and all the rest of that. I, I So I'd kind of say that. And I'd also defend the show in that deadliest catch, yes, for a while. But if you look at what the show has done recently uh, in the last couple of years, I got to take my hat off to him. I think they've done a fantastic job. Their show on AI and on advanced technologies, I thought was fantastic. I think their shows where uh, our, our buddy there has gone out on the road. What's his name? Zucolas or uh, George? Yeah, uh, George. Yeah, George. My Greek compadre there. You know, I think his his it's very very great. You know, you're getting him out there on the road, talking to people. It's no longer the blue screen. He's down, feet on the ground, kind of doing stuff. We never would have imagined, I don't think, that we would have this kind of mainstreaming of these ideas. So I'm a, I'm a big cheerleader. Go, 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 you know. Well, fair enough. <laughs> okay Good. i'm not i did write a whole book about it i don't think it's the best explanation <laughs> we shall we shall uh, we shall return to that uh because yeah. you know best explanation well, well let's let's stop right there what is a better explanation today given the data we have and you can't default to jacques Vallée because that's not really an explanation. It's just a call to broaden the interpretation possibilities. So uh, the, when you talk about the similarity between pyramids, um, if you include Gunung Padang in that, which is in the book, and I think you should, you're dealing with um, a, a pyramid building project that, is, that happened multiple times over about between 15 and 20,000 years. So if they're the inspiration for it, how many times did they come down and where are they? Um, there is a better, there is, there has to be a better understanding of what um, human interaction with off planet is that allows for these kind of ideas to recur over time because they absolutely do. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily require physical Syrians landing in West Africa and talking to the Dogon when we have no evidence of that, but we do absolutely have evidence for um, telepathy and, you know, uh, distant, like nonverbal communication when we do these kind of things. So the Syrians don't actually need to get here to tell us this stuff. And what if it's the actual stars themselves? Like this is coming back to Dr. Sheldrake, right? When um, he, if he asks, like the implications, which neither is like this, but it's a, it's a correct way of describing it. Um, the implications of panpsychism is that the sun has some form of consciousness. Now, neither is a panpsychist for very good reasons, but 
that's what I mean. Like rather than having something for which we have no evidence, we do have evidence for these psych capacities. And it seems like that's a better place to start with. That was sort of the whole point of the book, rather than having aliens keep showing up. Um, that's- I just wonder if it, I agree, like this is the cool thing about uh, talking with you and, and having this kind of exchange, because I feel like we can immediately go to the kind of what I always call the level three kind of thing beyond yeah. the, you know, oh, this can't possibly be true beyond the beat back at the skeptics beyond the, oh, yes, tell me, please tell me the answer and just hash out, you know, the real disagreements. Uh, and not disagreements, but possibilities, because that's really what we're talking about. Yeah. So I interviewed a guy just recently. It was a fantastic interview, because I, I love when these interviews go in totally different directions than I, I anticipate. So the guy's name is Steve Briggs, and I know him through my friend Rick Archer at Bid at the Gas Pump, because they both, for 20 years, were following around Maharishi and doing whatever he said in the TM movement. And for 20 years, this guy was training some of the top corporate leaders in India on transcendental meditation and then meditation techniques. And he was highly advanced and he's meditating for seven, eight hours a day. And that, except when he goes on retreats and then he's meditating for 20 hours a day for long periods of time. And he's traveling through India and he's meeting these unbelievable sages and mystics and he meets one. And the guy says, uh, he's, he describes him as this just beautiful, beautiful man, like uh, like features are beautiful, but he also has this glow about him and he goes to talk to this guy and the guy says, yeah, you know, I'm like 105,000 years old or whatever the hell these crazy Indian stories are. But then he gives him some really practical advice. He says, look, here's what you can do to improve your meditation practice. And you've already been meditating for 20 years, but you're so pretty far along that you can just do these simple things. And the next thing he does is write what you were saying he says, and here's how you can astral travel and astral travel better. And here's how you can gather your internal energies and travel. So he travels and he travels oh. to Syria, to the Syrian star system. And he meets. So this is the interview, right? So I'm interviewing this guy. And first, let me say that this guy is kind of like a very conventional guy in a lot of ways. NBA, uh, tennis uh ex you know played tennis at a at a national level in college through for a scholarship Th that's when he had his first spiritual slash psychic experience was on the tennis court when you know it's kind of the michael jordan effect everything slows down and i can see the tennis ball boom 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 and he's like 14 years old when this happens and he wins the match and he's like nationally ranked and all this stuff so again there are all these elements to the story that tie us to a reality that we can all accept. And mm -hmm. now he's going to tell you he travels to the Syrian star system. And now the story gets even wilder because he says they have all these different planets and they have all these different technologies. And his explanation, just to throw this on the table, for the starships, for the UFOs, is they're like, why not? Yeah, we could, we can and do show up psychically, but. It's fun. We show up in starships sometimes too. And that's the way we do it. And why wouldn't we do it? And we like interacting and, you know, the whole thing. So it's trippy, but it's like, in another way, I've thought about that many times since. It's like, that's a very fucking reasonable explanation. Oh, I'm, I'm as here well. for it. I love it. I love it. I'm here for it. I think that's great. Like, that's, that's not that far from what I kind of think is going on. Absolutely. Which is, you're right, you're right. That is not contradictory to what you're saying. It's, again, taking the interpretation part of the formula and saying, you know, we're talking about interpretation. Well, we can really kind of wad that up into a ball and throw it into a wastebasket, too, because all bets are off. We can interpret it just about every way you could imagine. Yeah. And, and this guy, um, I haven't listened to that show. I've been, you know, as you can see, I've been uh, out and about um, fleeing bushfires. But um, I... I don't see what he described isn't that far from what and I just mean in starships about what I actually think is going on, like in the universe, like that, that level of purpose of, of yes. interaction is like, why the fuck not? It, like that relationality, um, I think is what's going on. I think that's what's going on. Spirits, aliens, whatever you want to call it. I think it's just, if you've ever been scuba diving and you see um, different, you know, fish species and other organisms that are in there, they're all just kind of like checking each other out. Like, what else is there to do? Like, we exist. Let's interact. And I, I think that is good. 
you know, that is somewhat of a lead into the next topic that I was going to toss on the proverbial table, being at the PowerPoint screen here, because it is a perfect lead in, isn't it, to magic and to yep. how we might understand the extended consciousness realms and what's going on there, because there is all this confusion. And like you and I were talking, was it on air or was it not when we we're saying, you know, throw a little sage or burn a little sage and throw a little salt on the ground. And I don't know, it just seems to work over and over again. And, you know, why not? And, and then how far do you want to go with the why not thing? But the, the larger question, if I can pull back without totally confusing everyone, is I want to apply this data versus interpretation meme to magic because I think the challenge is, as I was just kind of stumbling through, is we get so many different sources of data, depending on where we look for magic, whether we look in Christianity, which is a point that you've always made, I think, quite eloquently and, and, and in a way that kind of jolts people into a realization that they have to have this broader understanding, at least, of what our connection to this extended consciousness magic realm is. But let me set, step back and any uh, initial thoughts on data interpretation as it applies to magic. Uh, it's definitional. Um, I've always wanted to ask you what your definition of unextended consciousness is um, for a start. Yes. <laughs> but it's yes. definitional. But, bingo. No, I, you, let me roll over and play dead. Hmm. Uh, because I think that is an indication. And the other one is, um, and, and you learn this, like talking about Dr. Hunter, for instance, um, mutual friend, Jack Hunter, when you look at some of the things that are available, like separating data and interpretation uh, or um, theory and practice is itself a practice. So what um, disciplines like anthropology have sort of worked out over the last 30 years is that even if we try to split it as experiment and then results or data generation and interpretation as two separate things, they are in fact one continuous process. They are in fact a, a behavior that um, Westerners coming out of an empirical mindset do. And when we want to start doing comparison, and this is what the anthropologists did, we drop down to that level and realize we are a, we are a kind of continuously embodying or, or from an embodiment or bodied perspective, this is how we organize the world. And it's at that level that we approach um, non-empirical cultures because they're kind of going along this organizing and interpreting of the world splits into visions of things like data and interpretation as well. And they look very different. If we, drop, if we jump up to a level where we try to look at their data and then interpret it, we actually haven't got out of our own heads to do it. So um, unextended consciousness, we'd need to de define magic, we'd need to define, and we'd also just need to hang a lamp on the fact that when we split things like this and we try to look cross-culturally and in a kind of Jeff Kripal comparison mode, we have to be really careful that as we do it, we aren't actually just still being Cartesian as, as we jump into non-Cartesian cultures because it just breaks on impact when we do it. So that would be where I begin with it. Um, if we want to define magic, um, I always define it this way, and I think it's the, the kind of best opening gambit. It's, it's a culture-specific way of describing uh, the psych capacities of, of a human, at least. So because the, the, the powers that magic has is conserved across culture, and we have them, and this is the Dr. Raiden stuff, right? Like, and we have observed them in an empirical um, fashion to both yours and my satisfaction that they exist. So um, over the last 120 years, um, how they, um, how they present and how they are experienced and embodied outside of our culture um, is very different around the world. But that's, that's kind of what I mean. Like we, it's so fraught uh, uh, on the first step. It, it's actually easy. It's actually a really easy step to go, okay, so we're going to jump down here. I get that. And then all of a sudden these, these kind of cross-cultural relational activities like the Syrians and the humans, uh, just why not for the fuck of it, um, become available to us in a way that isn't extractive or um, damaging. So it's actually really, really easy, but it's so easy that we sometimes miss it. And that's what I really, really like about what's happened in anthropology in the last couple of decades, that they've had to, they had further to go in, in getting 
that right because anthropology is of course the discipline that has literal skeletons in its closet in in <laughs> Amsterdam and London and Chicago that they have to kind of sheepishly give back to like the Maori and the Aborigines and whatever so they have actual skeletons and so they've done a lot more of that soul searching work and there are some really good techniques about how we do this relationality that I think have um, tremendous use when it comes to the kind of stuff we do on our shows um, which is that what, what, what can we learn from? What life ways are interacting with us and what does that mean for our life ways? Oh, oh so cool. So awesome. There's so many things to pull apart there. I, and I always want to kind of jump right in with the adversarial kind of point and why not? That's my nature. I love what you're saying on, on so many levels. And let's start with the extended, non-extended. So spot on. But your point is super well taken. And if anyone missed it, the idea that I think you're trying to get across is we can't really talk about extended consciousness realms without defining what the consciousness realm in its entirety is. We can't start putting these arbitrary dividers up, especially when those dividers wind up being brick walls that are 20 feet high that no one is allowed to jump over unless they have certain academic credentials or some other credential like you're the super shaman that wears the beaded uh, feathered cap on then you can jump over but no one else can and neither one of us kind of like those kind of limitations i would suggest that i punch back a little bit that the 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 definition that you give of magic has the same limitations when we talk about psi, ca psi capabilities. Because in the same way, when we start defining what is psi and we start differentiating it from our everyday experience, in some ways that makes sense and we can understand it. But in other very ordinary ways, we come to understand that there is no separation. So Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Uh, so I start with that as a definition because it's like landing coordinates to, to situate the discussion. Right. Because if you actually look at, say, Eduardo Cohn's work in a marvelous book called How Forests Think, um, we need to situate that, we, we need to shock ourselves, and it, it, it's just baked in there. It's the difference between extended and unextended. I know that you don't actually have, when you stop to think about it, um, a model that allows for some sort of artificial divide between um, consciousness as experienced when you're at the supermarket and when you're astral traveling. It's, it's a... Um, it's consciousness. It is what it is, right? So the, if you start with the psi thing, you can situate yourself and going, okay, this is in fact how far um, this way of being in the world can sort of extend. And once you go to non-enlightenment cultures and, and, and experience their life ways and, and kind of compare them to your own in that sort of cryptolesque way, you find that there is no difference um, between the dream realm and the spirit realm and, and all. And so their model of how, their flow model of how reality works um, has a, a much, direct, not clean is the wrong word. Uh, it is the wrong word. And you're going to keep coming I mean? up. No, but you're <laughs> going to keep coming up with the wrong word. And that's one of my, my concerns when we look at, you know, I've thrown up on the screen uh, a, a slide from one of my just favorite movies of all time, Embrace of the Serpent, because I think it, it captures point. this interplay between these two different magicians the one magician who is the evil colonist that comes and chops people's arms off when they don't produce enough rubber, but he is truly a magician. And his sure. ability to wield that hatchet in this most unbelievably wicked way uh, is eventually in this movie, we're not sure whether that conquers or defeats the magic of the shaman who I thought they did an awesome job of portraying as being truly lost and truly challenged by his beliefs because everything he thought he knew about how the world works has now been called into question by these guys who just come in with their fucking hatchets and just chop people's arms off. But at the same time, we're introduced to this shamanic way of knowing and being in the world that that pulls us apart in another way. And let me digress into a, a short story because I, I had a fascinating interview with a, a woman uh, who approached me on to do a Skeptico show. And you know how that is when people approach you and you're always like, oh yeah, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic work. I, I listened. Jan. I heard it. Jan, Jan yeah, yeah, and the I, old I, I listened to that one. So, yep. so 
you know, Jan is has a bookstore in Seattle, and this Russian guy comes and says, "Hey, I've been working with these people, the Ulche people, the original shamans in this remotest of remote area of uh, Russia, and here they are, and I'd love to do a talk." Does a talk, and subsequent to that, for the next twenty years, <laughs> brings over these shaman leaders, mainly women. Uh, just so happens to be, but one or two men, and they come. And so, you know, the the way I kind of titled that, or the way I really kind of poked Jan, and she's an awesome, awesome uh, researcher and woman, but, you know, where's your fucking iPhone, shaman? Mm. You know, where's your fucking iPhone? And I thought her pushback was just awesome, too. And she's like, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good point. So they, they do not have that. And they like coming over to Washington and being able to order Chinese food and have it show up at the door. They think that's oh, yeah. absolutely My- fantastic. She says, but I still struggle yeah. with understanding how when we were in a locked room and uh, inside hiding from the weather elements of Washington, they made the wind blow all the papers in the room around in a big circle or how we could go out in nature and they could make animals come up to us just like they were in a petting zoo just out of the forest so how do we how do we interpret that how do we i'm really that glad to- you asked because my my response is i think better <laughs> Um, you were correct that in, in, you know, amongst a Siberian shamanic culture, they do not have a government surveillance device that causes cancer and it's made by suicide slave labor. Um, so, and they use these devices. Um, I'll tell you my New Guinean story in a minute. But my, I guess, question back to the question would be, how come your iPhone can't call Sirius? Yet. Um, yeah, but how come it can't? So, like, th- this device contacts people. How far can it get? And how many towers does it need? Because I can talk to Sirius. Not me personally, but that would be the pushback. Um, and so if you situate, and it's coming back to the idea of what level we do uh, cross-cultural comparison on, and if we do it in a flow model, it al- which is why these sort of devices can... Um, be uh, joyously absorbed into um, the lifeways of, say, you know, non-Western uh, culture. Because if you approach it on a, on a, this is a thing that Western culture did as it's going along, then at that level, you can look at them. And I absolutely agree that the sort of technology share that would happen prior to, shall we say, the Industrial Revolution, but like arguably prior to the rise of cities, uh, happen like we, we have the archaeological evidence oh you make a better basket or you make a better bowl like that sort of thing as do techniques like meditation move because they they work better and so my um my father grew up in new guinea and my aunt is actually new guinean uh, and so he kind of has an understanding of where a good understanding of where different things from a quote-unquote Western culture can be useful and helpful in non-Western senses. So every time we, growing up, we'd go to the islands every year because he missed it. Uh, and we, he'd sort of, we'd get to Sydney and he'd go into like a, a tourist tat store and he'd buy a whole bunch of like $5 like I Heart Australia t-shirts and all that kind of <laughs> And he'd take them and he'd take hats and he'd take thongs and we'd go and visit um, different, you know, outlying communities and whatever. And not in like a weird Christian way. Like we were there holidaying, let's be clear. We're not saving right. anyone. But it's just, he knew that we were in their lives and we bring things and they fucking loved them. Like we would come back a couple of years later and they're still wearing the shirts uh, yeah. because they don't, they don't have them. They're not in Sydney. You know, they don't, <laughs> they don't have this stuff. And it's a really good, this has been from a policy perspective, something that um, Brazil worked out, not now, they're in a quite bad way politically. But a, a few decades ago when it was, you're trying to na- navigate what, how far, at what arm's length do you quote unquote hold um, native Brazilians living in the Amazon? Because it's like, well, how racist is it to keep them in a pristine state? where they're all there without shoes and in loincloths in an area riddled with deadly snakes and saying, oh, God, give me some shoes. And some shoes would be great right now. And I think that totally. is um, when, we, when we talk about technology share and, and, and how, um, I don't even like the word better, but like how ideas that have some utility across culture move. Um, the iPhone is a good example. Uh, but so is meditation. So is um, the use of ayahuasca for contacting spirits. These are things 
um, they no, are. To- totally. But let me, let me j- jump leapfrog this a little bit because where I'm really going and I can't usually jump that far ahead with folks is I'm worried about interested in concerned with ET and ET's ability to marshal technology in this forgive the term extended consciousness realm, but I got to keep using it because people know what it means as opposed to UFOs versus aerial phenomena or whatever they want to call it. So when we, when we hear what ET is doing in terms of screen memory, in terms of Mm. telepathic telepathic communication, in terms of long-term surveillance and potentially counterfeited spiritual experiences where people come back and say, oh, I've had this incredible spiritual awakening. I've had this healing. And another person comes back and goes, really? All I did is got (laughs) fucked by a reptilian. You know, it's like, well, where's the spiritual transformative? I mean, that can be, I guess. But so when I look at that, that makes me look at the shamanic noble savage kind of thing halo that we can do that isn't like you said arm's length kind of thing might not be the right approach either so i just wonder how we're supposed to figure that shit out and i'm not worried about being racist and i'm not worrying about being fair i'm just worrying about trying to understand it and not favoring one over another in a way that is going to cloud my ability to interpret what might really be going on and how much of this magic thing might be linked to a technology that we don't fully understand. And when we do understand it, you will have an app to talk to the series. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, so uh, so many things there that, um, I think we actually need to pivot more to their understanding. Let me, let me start here instead, because I was just up at a conference speaking about UFOs and contactees and, and talking to the Pleiadians and all that really kind of like boomer stuff. And I gave a presentation called What If We're the Aliens? But I'll tell the you... The presentation was what? Called What If We're the Aliens? And it's a right. panspermia talk, right? Right. Um, but I'll tell you that I, I, having you know, spoken to a number of demons, they will flat out say, yeah, we're trolling people. Like they, they think they're talking to um, the Galactic Federation. That's us, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> now, the argument then is, in fact, for more magic, not less, because where's your fucking iPhone is the opposite when you go to cultures that never lost this um, wary extra dimensional diplomacy component with the majority of shamanic practice isn't happy healing stuff. It is keeping bad shit away from the fucking village. The techniques for navigating the fact that the, um, the spirit world is is sometimes deceptive, but it is certainly never presented um, as, as factual. Like what you see is never what you get in the spirit world. And you have cultures that have, millennia of experience of navigating that and we have an iphone so i would argue that in fact we need more of it rather than less and the notion that any kind of contact experience is automatically a good one like oh look at me i'm i've had a a spiritual experience is a very western post-christian idea right oh visited by an angel or whatever like that kind of contact is quite neoplatonic the idea that oh look i've um Something happened to me. I, I, I interacted with a star brother. You won't find that level of optimism. You will find a wariness and, and, a, and a hard-won cynicism in cultures that just know better from more experience of the spirit world. And they're like, it might be that. It might be something else. And magic is, frankly, um, better uh, at, and I, I can even shrink that down to Western magic, uh, is better at navigating the, the, the reality that this is a deceptive and enigmatic process because it has those fail safes built into it. And within, within animistic cultures, you, when you say, uh, once we learn fully what magic is about, you never will. The, you kind of have an open cosmology that is hyper pragmatic because you admit and understand that you will never fully know what's going on, but you nevertheless have to be in the world and interact. So like what techniques, what, what ways of being in the world kind of work in this sort of getting along together way. So I would argue that's for wrong more with the same problems, right? I mean, I, you will acknowledge that th- that is wrought with the same problems that you're trying to kind of 
get past or overcome, right? So no, you, I would disagree. I would because well, you it, it, you want you want animism as an ontology. I'm looking for an epistemology. So you, I know that this the the rise of magic has somewhat irritated you over the last year, and I'm sorry to bring a bad news that. It's, it still has much further to run than, than Dean Radin. Uh, but what I'm looking for is an epistemology, and you're worried that it will replace your ontology. You're worried well, not, that... Not totally. Um, so I, I, I fully agree with the point about, you know, more is better in this case, right? So a, a more, in, inclu- more expansive understanding of those modalities for interacting with... Uh, but, you know, we're always going to be struggling with words in this discussion, this kind of inside baseball level three discussion, because as soon as we start talking about spirits, we don't know what the fuck a spirit is, no more than we know what consciousness is. It's all part of the same blob that we're pulling apart. But he, here I would try and circle this back to my point, because I'm really interested in getting your uh, your insight on this, because it's fantastic. But did you listen to our friend Greg Carlwood's excellent interview with Whitley Strieber? Uh, if it was in the last month or so, because I've been traveling and then fleeing bushfires, I'm behind in everything, I'm afraid. So I, I haven't. Know, I don't um, know how far back it was, but it was, it was quite extraordinary. And it was extraordinary, uh, particularly at this one moment when Whitley's talking about being, uh, I don't want to say abducted because he wasn't. He was voluntarily admitted by his parents in this special youth program and mm-hmm. at an Air Force base in San Antonio where these kids were subjected to just a horrible kind of uh, a Skinner cage. You know, you walk in to the, to the facility and these kids did. And, and just to digress slightly, Strieber says, I, I can hardly believe that this happened, except I found two other boys who were with yeah. me and one boy who wasn't because his parents, when they came and told them about the special program for gifted children in the Skinner box, as in BF Skinner said, get the hell away from my house and don't come back. But mm. his parents weren't so inclined or his parents were part of it, whatever we're supposed to think. And he was dressed up in his Sunday best every week in order to go to this camp. And when he first goes in on the Air Force Base, there's these kids locked in these little cages. And they said, that's what happens to children who tell their parents what mm-hmm. happens. And it turns out that the purpose of this exercise, as near as he could tell it, I should say exercise, this torture this mk ultra program is to break these people open to break these souls open in order to access this extended consciousness realm and once we do this investigation like you and i have we say totally understandable i mean in the shamanic traditions many of them have similar kind of not not that they're not culturally um uh, understood to be torturous. They're understood to be uh, rites of passage, whether it's a sweat lodge or whether it's some other kind of experience or being stung by bees, but that would be kind of in a different thing. But anyways, the point is the same. That is the technology that I guess I'm talking about, because certainly those folks in the Air Force, the MK Ultra three-letter agency, they weren't doing this from a, 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 a shamanic or a magic perspective, they were doing it as near as we can tell is, let's figure out how the fucking aliens do it and do it the same way. Because what I always point to is, you know, my friend Grant Cameron and the famous Wilbert Smith memo, where right there, it's written down, we've gone to the US, we found that the UFOs are real, and that the mental component of it is something they're very, very interested in. And this sure. fits in that time frame. Let's see if we can break people open in order so that we might perfect this technology. And that's what intrigues me, Gordon, is that what if there really is a technology component to this? And, and if you will like, stretch technology to mean it, where we they can get to some level and in that respect maybe we would look at the shamanic and the magic traditions that you're talking about just in a different perspective not worse better but you know kind of the a, a different perspective in terms of how developed they are and how efficacious they are at the desired result um, I would suspect that that, again, is a definitional challenge. Like you kind of landed on it towards the end there where it's like, well, how do you find technology? And, and if you want to do that comparison, you kind of have to go techne 
uh, go back to the ancient Greek. And, and I, I like to use words like cultural complexity instead, uh, because it is not obvious to me, although it's certainly entirely possible. Firstly, all that Whitley stuff, 100%, like, sure. Uh, like, that's, that's one of the things that is alarming. I would just say, before we talk about the technology thing, if we are comparing the clear M ultra projects there of trying to um, weaponize these capacities of these children, uh, that is kind of trying to break into the spirit world, whereas typically, and the word shaman is, is culturally bound. We all right. know that, but right. we know what we're talking about. What you will find in cultures that have this as a function within it is that the spirits choose them. So you don't, you don't torture all the children in a tribe. You find the ones that the spirits have picked and go, unfortunately for you, my little son or daughter, you all aren't going to have a very good life. <laughs> you get to be the shaman. Um, and that's that truly horrible. And God only knows what they found with these, uh, these projects, but it's, it's kind of a, it's a military assault on the spirit world. So if we want to kind of compare these two, that's, that's worth thinking with. As to what, what I think you're getting at is, has it already happened or um, will we one day somewhere in an underground base have a device or, or um, a, a machine that can bodily move you into the spirit world or teleport you via, you know, spirit tunnels, whatever you want to call them, to like other points in the galaxy. Can, will, a, um, will the underground bases have a military version of some of the capacities we find in cultures that never lost magic? Hold on, because will... that's one question, but here's the second question that I want you to answer at the same time. I want to use your term, cultural complexity. And I want to suggest, is it possible that E.T. has a cultural complexity that includes a mastery of some of this stuff, this extended consciousness stuff that makes our understanding of shamanic cultures as well as magic traditions look like that photo that I have up the, on the screen of the uh, nearly naked uh, Amazonian people who we admire in some respects, but in other ways go, you know, here's your compass, go find your way to the, to the river. And there's a boat on there with a motor in it. It's a lot easier. Uh, I think what, what happens is you kind of get to that um, end point of where does technology. So one of the other things Whitley said, which I liked is that uh, advanced civilizations elsewhere in the galaxy have presumably developed a way to maintain continuous communication after death. So that the, the death is all like, and we would have been close, honestly, I think if we, if spiritualism in the mid 1800s had gone in a different direction from a policy perspective, we may well have been there. And that rather changes, it's, it's not even a technological solve at that point. What that means is that you are, you are fully, you're operating in the full universe rather than, um, the component of it that you can perceive while you're still in a meat suit, right? And so when you talk about a technology that relies on, shall we say, like the physics of magic or the fact that the universe is magic and a technology built on that, you're still in a universe that's magic. So you kind of get to this end point where you go, okay, so a civilization that can maintain continuous communication beyond death and, and can do instantaneous interplanetary transport and so on, those things can only work because the universe is magical is you know I, i'm using that term but you know what i mean like we live in an yes. animate whether it's consciousness universe so yes and no what i would say back and I, I know this has happened to you as well but it certainly happened to me having on my travels to various like you know sacred sites and weird places and, and being amongst like um tribal fetish objects and, and all this kind of stuff is that a rock can do that. If you go to say Marie Laveau's tomb in uh, in New Orleans, as you walk up to it, your blood pressure drops, and it's a tomb. It's just <laughs> it's from that level of reality that the technology can be built. And who's to say it hasn't? Remember, you've had guests on that can astral travel. Like so, who's to say it hasn't? I agree with you that um, you, you just end up with this kind of. Um, infinite or vanishing point where we might do it on a mechanistic basis or we might do it on an animistic basis, but you'll still end up at this point, the realization that you are in an animate magic, um, all consciousness universe, whatever will, will occur. Um, and that's kind of where I'm like, I'm not sure. Uh, are you? Yeah. And are there entities in the galaxy that have, 
consciousness ray guns for one of I don't know, you know, <laughs> an example? Do they have do they have an iPhone that calls the devil? I don't like yeah, probably because you know the the UFO contact experience, especially when you get to things like screen memory and so on, is is a little alarming. It's that's there's no other question. You know, I, I think that's worth thinking with. You know, I could hammer on this on and on, but you've brought up so many great points. I, I, I just think we're going to lose ourselves in the complexity of it, but awesome kind of discussion. Let's bring it back to Dr. Dean. Yeah. Maybe more of a down to earth kind of discussion that you and I have had offline and we'll share as much as you feel comfortable with kind of online here, but we both interviewed Dr. Dean Raiden. You did an excellent interview with him and I kind of was, a little bit meaner to him, but still, I, I appreciated very much him, him coming on. And if I was mean to him, if I'm saying I was mean to him, it's because the vanishing point that you're talking about, I think, has to be on the forefront of our mind as we walk down this this path. The vanishing point being that we're going to reach hyperspace when we realize that the shaman is no different than the ET in terms of their ability to manipulate the extended consciousness realm because it all reaches some higher dimension that then totally escapes what we can, uh, is beyond our understanding. And that's where the action probably really begins. And I just wonder, as awesome as Dean is and as important as his work is, can he really catch up to there given you know when you talk to dean he says you know to be honest with you and i so appreciate his honesty is i didn't even think of the term spirit seriously until a year ago and if he is on the vanguard and for god's sakes he is on the vanguard but mm, sure. if, if he is on the if he is on the edge of this does science really has science in this sense have a, a chance of catching up uh, um, this is where maybe I would swap that out again to just be a bit more precise and say empiricism. And I think Dean has got this right. Like uh, empiricism is fascinating because my definition of it, uh, and it's a good one philosophically, is that uh, empiricism is the notion that nothing exists outside of sense data. And, and scientific results are a subset of sense data because you perceive the results, right? And it invalidates itself as a, um, as a full uh, explanation for the universe because the statement that nothing exists beyond sense data is a statement you make without the sense data to support it. You are making a statement about the universe that nothing exists that I can't perceive. Now, um, that, but once you realize that, empiricism becomes exceptionally useful because you've made it the right size. And this is how we can do things like archaeology and whatever. And I think Dean has absolutely nailed it by, uh, in the last book, by taking the empirical uh, exploration of magic, um, an animate universe, the reality of Psy, whatever you want, to as far as it can. And I think he was really good with us both at holding the line. I think he's like, this is literally all we can get here, but this is all that this can show us. That doesn't mean that's all that is there in the world. So I really like that Dean... And, and maybe it's his kind of cosmic function in the world. I really like that Dean holds that light because like I asked if it's true, it's true for, and especially this is real skeptical stuff, right? Like um, it's true that the data cannot, I mean, to our satisfaction, sure, but cannot definitively land on the existence of an afterlife or spirits or any of that stuff because you can't perceive it because it, this is how big empiricism is. It's one circle and this stuff is outside of it. And whilst we all agree, like the data are pretty, like it's just that we can't use this one technique to conclusively land on it. it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means like, it, it, in fact, it's a really good argument. Like empiricism is completely filled up with like this, this stuff is real, but we need other techniques. We need other epistemologies, hence why I'm interested in that rather than ontologies to be able to go, okay, well then where do we, what other means of truth validation exist for us outside of empiricism? And so I, I, I loved both those interviews and he's to be congratulated because we all agree, like it's, it's a pretty good case that, you know, the spirit world exists and life continues after death, but you cannot get to it with an empirical model conclusively. You can get to something is going on. And it was so good of him to kind of go, 
no, I will not be drawn outside of it. And I'm, I'm really happy he held that line and, and it leaves us to kind of blow in the wind, outside of it, which is where we belong. <laughs> we want you on that wall. We need you on that wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's, I mean, it's so good. He's, he's just got such the mind and the experience to go like, I can't, you cannot design an experiment to objectively um, demonstrate empirically you can't design an experiment. Yeah, empirically yeah, and, and I'm with it. you. I, I, I'm, I'm with you, and I'm totally 100% supportive of, of Dean. I love what you said about the magical shrinking machine, and that is the most beautiful metaphor that I've heard. My problem is when I really step back and want to be honest and not be so nice, is that you've now shrunk it down to where it isn't that meaningful or important. Science has now obsoleted itself in terms of the larger investigation of who are we, why are we here, and you've just relegated it to a small part of it. It, it. it can help, but the shrinking machine, you know, can be a problem. I don't, I don't think it can, and this is why I was specific about empiricism. So empiricism isn't science. These are two different things. Um, science relies on empiricism currently exclusively in which as a way to, um, as it's exclusive epistemology, it relies on empiricism. It doesn't need to. Uh, and, and this is something that Western philosophy, which is um, hit and miss, but one of the things, and it comes back to what we're talking about, there are other forms of proof that we have had available to us for 2,500 years. We've had mathematical proofs. We've had logical proofs. We have had for whatever they were. Yeah, yeah but, but hold on, hold on. I mean, if, if Dean has helped us make any change at all, it's that the shade casting that's been done on empiricism is now flipped. And th what we can say now is empiricism really is the only game in town because all those other things you're talking about aren't real. We can't really measure things. No, we, but can't that's... Really, we can't really do mathematics. We really can't because it's all an abstraction of something that we don't know what it really is. The only that's game in town is empiricism. The only it's game not, in town is empiricism. It's not. You're using empiricism, which is an epistemology, as an ontology again. And that's the error. So there is nothing, and this is the kind of realization that happens across disciplines, nothing stops there is nothing that can prevent you from doing that baseline philosophical work of what is reality. Empiricism is the next level down. And I don't think it makes it, um, I don't think it diminishes it. I think it restores it and makes it useful again so that it's not designed to be an ontology. It's designed to be an epistemology and we keep using it as an ontology. And if you, if you just let it be what it is again, Yes, you have to do the hard work of going like, well, that's one method of truth validation. But nevertheless, here I am as an organism or consciousness or whatever in a universe that has that capacity. What can I learn about it? And this is the Western philosophical journey. It's the Eastern one, too, in many respects, is you, nothing can stop you. There is no like, oh, look, done. Um, I have empirically generated data that um, solves a, a crucial thing that every human has to do, which is those foundational philosophical principles or work. Nothing prevents that. Um, and empiricism, turning it back into an epistemology, is tremendously useful on that personal quest to do so. So I don't think, I, I think it's the opposite. I think it's made it better rather than worse to make it, to, to just let it be what it was initially. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move on and let it go. And the next time we talk, I'll, I'll ask you to finish that thought about what ontologies, what maps of the territory are really something that we can that we can put up on the wall and be proud of. Because I, I don't think I don't think they exist, but but I don't think any of those other alternative ontologies really kind of get us in. But I, but I shut up and move on. Um, so here's a fun one. Another chance to poke the bear or poke the guest as it is in this case. But I think the data versus interpretation thing with regard to social engineering, what some people call conspiracy, which is if there ever was a social engineering of a term, it's the social engineering of conspiracy as conspiracy as opposed to what it really is, is 
90% of the time, a social engineering project by someone, by a government, either our government or a foreign government or a corporation or a shadow government or somebody. Sure. I think there's this data versus interpretation thing going on. People get tired of me talking about the Gloria Steinem example, but I love it because still a lot of people, it's something we can touch and we can go and actually put our finger on. It's one of the few times that one of the players actually stands out, is stupid enough to stand outside and go, well, yeah, I really was a, a, a player in a social engineering project. And then we find out that she not only was, but still is. So mm. here's my poke at you. To what extent is the current kind of neoliberal, quasi-proto, pseudo-progressive divide, a social engineering project, because it sure as hell looks like one to me. It looks like another version. I mean, it took me seven or eight years into Skeptico to realize that biological robot in a meaningless universe is not just a bunch of dumb guys who haven't figured out an obvious kind of observation. It is somehow a Social engineering, useful idiot, you know, isn't it better if we send things down this path kind of thing? And I always like the example you give of, well, look at the frontier science done in the darkest corners of those agencies. They were way past the materialistic model yeah. a long time ago. And I wonder if the same thing isn't going on here. So when we see these social movements, it just, to me, smacks of social engineering. What think you, Gordon? I think um, a, some of it, yes. I think a lot of it is inertia. So I think we are still in the after effects of some, uh, either successful or abandoned um, 20th century technocratic engineering ones. So if you look at um, feminism post, and I, I don't know quite what Steinem was for. Um, for the CAA, other than surveillance. But I rather suspect it has to do, um, I think they're interested in whether feminism could be used to reduce population. Um, I think I think that might have been it, because if you look at the kind of 20th century technocratic project, one of the things they were concerned about, um, and it's, uh, it's always the case, uh, I, I saw it like, one of the things they were concerned about is overpopulation. So I'm not, but here we are in a, in the inertia of a whole bunch of different ops and projects from um, Russian meddling to feminism to, to all the rest of it. And we're kind of in this car crash inevitable conclusion of what happens because there was so much inertia behind them. Even if they're not running now, we're still caught in the tumble of it. They're also, as far as I can tell, looking at the world in the last few years, um, there are more people private entities, billionaires, whatever you want, playing a game that used to pretty much have one player, at least in the West. Like during the Cold War, we had one player. And whether it was because the, the Anglo-American Alliance, whatever you want to call it, and, and the, um, the CIA and, and all the rest of it were more or less aligned in what they wanted to achieve for the West in the 20th century or not. Um, if you look at it now, what isn't an op? <laughs> so I think it's really, uh, we're in a kind of car crash of current ops and the inertia of historic ones. And I think that's just where we are. And it's a mess. You know, one thing I'd, I'd, I'd kind of throw out there is an explanation of these ops. Number one, I always fall back on the reactive versus proactive thing which is, I think, the first agenda is, hey, we have to have a foot in the door. We have to have a stake in that game. So yeah. you go and you co-opt or disrupt or infiltrate feminism. If for no other reason, then we'll figure out what the fuck to do with it later. Let's yeah. just make sure we, have, we, we, we can play in that's, that game. And, that's and, the British Empire model. That's absolutely it. To, yeah, and, and I yeah. think that's, that's smart. Uh, but I think if we were going to, if I was going to venture a guess on what the goal is, I think the first goal always since Constantine has been control. You sure, know, because course. that's our yeah. job is, is to control. And if we can pacify, disrupt, uh, and in this case, when you look at feminism, if we can atomize the family, if we can isolate, uh, make people more alone, afraid, less connected, then we're, we're always better off. 
in terms of from a control standpoint. Yeah. Well, it's easier to control the sheep in that way than it is in, in any other way. And that's my concern with like, when I look at like, uh, I have up there the, the first transgender Muslim kind of thing, because some of these things are actually bordering on the, on, on the kind of comical. And it's the same thing, in my opinion, is like, is there an issue in terms of uh, sexuality, in terms of, uh, absolutely. Is there an issue in terms of transgenderism and, uh, and rights and certain, um, discri uh, certainly discrimination, that's obvious. Absolutely. Is there an agenda that keeps cropping up in terms of trans, now finish that with whatever you want, you know, transhumanism, trans culturism, trans Atlantic globalization. I mean, I think there's a lot of things at play there in terms of an agenda that seems to be playing out in a bunch of different ways in this same way of atomizing, separating, and ultimately turning people into being more alone, afraid, less connected, and less spiritual in whatever way we want to kind of define that. What, what do you think? Well, um, well, that's kind of why I use the word technocracy, because I'll, I'll work backwards, because what you just said there is, is true, although I don't focus on... Here's the thing. The 20th century technocratic project, and you include all the people in it, like Bernays, that are, that are part of, uh, of the 20th century development of these capacities, right? So the technocracy thought it fell to these rich people to manage the development of the world and the West for our benefit. Right. So it isn't even just necessarily keeping them alone and afraid. That is a side effect of, well, we are the technocrats. We are better at running the world. So our, our competing narratives are here in the church and here in the family and so on. And what we actually want, because where are all the doctors, where are all the educators, where are all of this kind of stuff, you need to get it from us. And we will manage the society and you will eat the right food. And, and the population will grow or not at the rate that we determine. The economy will work. We, this is this is how this is the, the the demonic goal. So it's funny. That's why I wanted to start there. On a human level, that's the kind of 20th century idea I think they were shooting for. It is demonic. Like if you want to go to a higher level, when you're talking about well, what are the kind of metaphysical implications? I have no idea if any of these people realize they are being ridden by demons. But nevertheless, the goal of this kind of project is in is in some literal sense satanic. Um, when it comes back to what I was saying before about a car crash of different real and fake things and, and existing and, and historic agendas and so on. It's a pity that the word trans is used for transhumanism and something like trans rights because, and trans fats, like it's actually not a good <laughs> word. Like it's, it's it, and so we have this linguistic yeah. problem where things get conflated together and transhumanism is like up and down a technocratic plot. Exactly. Right. Um, uh, trans experiences and and kind of new explora explorations of, of gender and gender expression aren't. However, they are regularly weaponized. And they're exactly. weaponized for intentional reasons. And also because, and this is because Connor comes on the show a lot, Connor Habib comes on my show a lot, and we talk about this, which is you typically find, and obviously, uh, you typically find the promotion of or the, um, the defense of trans rights and, and trans visibility on the progressive end of the, uh, of the spectrum, right? Obviously. That is also the discussion you guys have when you go, it encapsulates, I think, where you're going. It's like, how come trans people aren't allowed in the military? And you're like, yeah. yeah. And then you're like, well, well, it's maybe, good. Is that a good thing? Yeah. Or a bad thing? It's great. Know? Just ban the rest of them now. Like, but mostly it's because on the left, where you find, um, and where you historically and typically and rightly, I guess, find the, um, this uh, promotion is the wrong word because it sounds like an agenda, but let's just say the defense and the prioritization of things like trans rights. You also get a kind of idiotic um, left materialism. You, you get the kind of Marxist reduction of everything back into a materialist labor interaction based on his, you know, observations of a 19th century industrial economy. So you have a definite weaponization of different manifestations of this. You have the part of it, which is good, which is, you know, People should be able to fucking live how they want to live. And you also have the people who are trying to help, as far as I'm concerned, aren't helping in the right way because you, you, the, the argument goes round and around on a materialist basis because from a progressive perspective, magic, for want of a better word, is, is dirty. It's, it's dirty. The Marxists don't like it. Um, the, 
the 20th century philosophers they rely on don't like it. Uh, and well, so you they're say kind magic, of helping. But you say magic and I substitute spiritual. You say magic, I substitute spirituality. Exactly. Same so, thing. If you come yeah. at it from an atheistic perspective, it's all gobbledygook within yeah. about two sentences. And unfortunately, the, the, the less the left, the progressive, the neoliberal has married themselves to just to a phil- philosophical kind of non-starter, nitwit, again, biological robot kind of yep, thing. 100%. And, and, yeah, and do, you and I, th- th- do you have any thoughts yeah. on that third picture down there? Uh, I have just so many. Oh, DeLong. Christ. Um, DeLong. And your buddy, Peter Lavenda. Oh, my God. To me, to me, this is the most clear example of a political rollout disclosure sure. kind of thing that that is masked by again all this bullshit of people talking about well did he did they did they should they would they it's a complete political disclosure rollout let's look at it as an operation and stop looking at it as a true disclosure i mean there was this information was disclosed but again it's your yeah. term weaponized you know what do you think of tom belong what do you think of peter lavenda my peter lavenda quote that i do have to get you to respond to the one that just had me pounding on the table and i was like i gotta push this back on gordon because gordon liked peter his re- retelling of the story is well and then uh tom DeLong called me and of course i hung up because i didn't believe it was tom DeLong. and he called me back and he said it really is and then we talked for a long time ago gosh we really got to crack this thing and there's so much misinformation, disinformation out there. We've got to get to the bottom of that. And we decided, well, the only way to do that was to go to the military. So that's what we did. We, you know what I mean? Full stop. Oh, really? That was the only way to get to the bottom of it. I mean, that isn't even a well-crafted story. I was like embarrassed that you even try and spin that out there to me. All right. I've, I've gone too far over the, over the moon there, but Tell me, tell me what you think in general about the political psyop disclosure that was. Oh, it was always going to be like I one. I think it's an abandoned one. Um, yes. We've had this discussion before. I think this stuff was to coincide with the movie Arrival and a Hillary Clinton presidency. Um, neither of which happened. Uh, and but they still I think, are, it's it's like a movie, right? We have it in the can. We spent all the money. We yeah, got yeah. it uh, yeah. because um, this. If you look at what, and you, you'll be in agreement and most of your guests when you talk about this stuff will as well. If you look at the majority of the, the kind of classic era UFO cases, they are patently U.S. Cold War propaganda um, covering secret military projects and, 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 and trying to kind of like influence the Soviets in the sense of like, well, maybe they do have a flying saucer. Like a, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff in the kind of classic cases is that. Now, all of a sudden, we have yet another kind of op of like oh well maybe we have these uh um these flying saucers and these these special ray guns and and we got this from aliens and it's and it's important that the american people know that this is here and that was to coincide with what you're still getting two-thirds of washington trying to want which is a um a conflict with russia and and a military dominance of eurasia so i think this is literally a um a semi-abandoned or let's see how this goes more air cover for the kind of things that uh, were, were going on in the Cold War because we're in a new Cold War. I think it's meant to, I think it's weirder with Tom DeLonge. I honestly think he's been mind controlled several times. And I don't know if you've heard him on, on some of the earlier yeah, yeah. Um, interviews where he's like calling people from the car and um, or he's like meeting people at the front yeah. of the Pentagon in the middle of the night. And I'm like, yeah. my good dude, you were being mind controlled. So um, I just it, interviewed, I just interviewed Kevin Day who is a super interesting guy. So Kevin Day is the the top gun intercept orchestrator of all those planes that are on the Tic Tac video that gets released. Mm -hmm. I can't go through the whole interview, but the guy certainly seems legit, 1000% legit. And the, the PTSD, uh, valet davis effect which i wasn't familiar with do you know the valet davis Mm -hmm. so valet davis effect are they went ahead they jacques valet and i forget dr davis's thing but they did a peer-reviewed published analysis of the after effects of contact related experiences and this guy says all of them check every box 
meanwhile, he's going to VA clinics and they're going, oh, complex PTSD. And he's like, yeah, kind of, but not really. And then he stumbles across eight years later, because this all happened a long time ago. It, he stumbles across Valet Davis and he goes, bingo, exactly. Yeah. And he traces it back to when he actually went up on board ship and actually took the glasses out and looked at these visitors and had an instantaneous experience. Meanwhile, he's using this state-of-the-art billion-dollar war machine instrumentation to track these things every different way possible. And he's seeing it, and the other boats and planes are seeing it. But then an Another interesting aspect of it is there's again this screen memory thing going on. And he retells this story so many times. And I listened to it, Gordon, and I finally asked him, I said, you know, I've talked to enough contactees. Let me ask you this part about the experience. Because you said that you observed these 20 flying objects basically trolling your ship for like four days. And they were flying at 22,000 feet at 100 knots. Can't do that. Nothing can do that. Mm -hmm. But you didn't think it was anything to worry about. I said, I got to tell you how many times I've heard that story from a contactee. Oh, I saw my wife being abducted. But I decided I should go upstairs and go back to bed because there was nothing there to worry about. Mm -hmm. So he not only has this experience, but all the other people in on the other boats that you know are having the same experience oh those are nothing to worry about they're just you know so i think there's something more than just uh war games uh advanced weapon or advanced technology being hidden i think it's a real contact experience and I think they're playing around with true disclosure. That is, I think there's, there is disclosure that could be planet changing, but there's a wrestling match, of the usual kind, in terms of who's going to control that information and how and when they bring it out, because obviously that can dictate how the script gets written from there on out. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd, I'd go the whole way there. It may well be, of course. Um, I, what, the closest I would get to that, because I still think this is, I, when I say it's an op, it doesn't mean because they know damn well that they don't have some of these toys that they're talking about, right? And I don't know the origins of those toys. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to have a crash spaceship to make some of the kind of things that exist that we're not supposed to, but maybe that's where you got them from. I do think there is a kind of signaling game going on at a... Um, higher geopolitical level. Um, and I think Russia and China, and obviously everyone is playing along the same, like they're trying to rattle sabers that we aren't supposed to think exists. So if you look at the recent Russia thing that may or may not be true, that they have like a ray gun that can cause hallucinations and vomits and they're putting on the ship, that may exist, that may not. But we have this kind of stuff going on in the West and they have that. And what I'm seeing is, is um, and I don't just mean to split it on a nation basis, obviously, because I think we're potentially too geopolitically sophisticated to, to have it as a national discussion or between nations discussion. But I do think in some of this hullabaloo and front page, New York, if for somebody to get on the front page of the New York Times, it gets signed off in Langley, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. <laughs> so I do think there's what we're seeing in a whole bunch of different fora at the moment on a, on a geopolitical stage, people are rattling sabers that we aren't supposed to, to know exists. And, um, and that would be as close as I get to, I think there's a wrestle over disclosure. I think they're like, you got flying saucers, I got a vomit producing ray gun. Perhaps. Hmm. Okay, we might, another topic, let's see if we have time to, to get to five or not. But this is one, first of all, Here's the guy, you're looking at the first guy I know who totally called out Patreon probably a year ago. Yeah, a year ago said, yeah, no, it ain't, it ain't going to happen. It's going to turn the way that all the other ones will turn as if we could see those other ones turning. Censorship, hardcore, softcore. So tell us, and, you know, I pulled to make my little meme there. <laughs> I found a very interesting headline just from the last couple of days from our buddy, but you know, Jack Conte, who's the CEO of Patreon, 
the news story that I ran across that I thought, you know, for people like you and I, we can would love to spin it and reading between the lines. But his big news flash was, hey, Patreon, the current Patreon model is not sustainable. And what he was signaling was, I think, hey, motherfuckers, get in line. You're worried about censorship. I'm going to I'm going to change the whole damn thing. Instead of getting 90%, I'm going to tell you how much you can get. And it's going to be a lot less than 90% in the, in the future. And more importantly, what he's signaling is I'm running a business here. And when I run a business, I listen to the people who basically set the rules for my business. And the rules for my business going forward are censorship because that's the game that is always going to be at play. It's only a matter of who's doing the censoring. What do you think of Patreon? Uh, well, like my background, I've been in startups and, and had them acquired. And, and from essentially my space on, um, a platform just gets worse. Um, it happens with Facebook. It happens with Twitter. And, and for, from a commercial perspective, um, Etsy and um, PayPal both kick off businesses that they decide or unilaterally, like an astrologer or something, that they declare doesn't exist. So it's like you're always at risk in our space, whether it's um, podcasts or whether it's magic or whatever you want. Um, how many times do you have to get fucked over by Silicon Valley's eternal um, just nature before you go, oh, no, this time it'll be different. This time it'll be great. And so I did have a bit of experience in like, there's no way this ends well because none of them have. <laughs> um, as for the censorship component on a macro basis, I actually, in a funny way, I think it's good news. Um, firstly, it is surprising to me that people didn't realize what platforms like Google, uh, like YouTube and whatever actually were and, and have kind of confused it is some sort of public free expression when it is a um, it's a corporate product that back back ends into DARPA, right? So, but but hold on, I mean, I, I think we have to make a distinction there because I, I, I'm with you when you say back into back ends into DARPA. But in another respect, it is the public square. It is the fourth estate. It is the of our time. It is, and that play could have been made. And I think that. You know, that those questions will be answered in the courts years from now. But sure. when I look at it, they're surely going to lose because, oh. you, you know, Jack Conte can't on one hand say I banned this right wing woman because she was endangering our, our group got together and decided. I mean, as soon as you start <laughs> policing your content in that way, then you are in the business of editorializing and you're putting yourself in a whole, sure. a whole different thing. So, and, and the, the whole thing with like with Alex Jones, who I also have up there, well, you like Alex Jones, don't like Alex Jones, which I think he has kind of exposed himself lately with the Trump Epstein thing, which he's mm -hmm. kind of gone way over. Clearly there's a connection there. And for him to, to allow his buddy Roger Stone to get on there and say, this oh really? Like a classic uh, digression, but Roger yeah. Stone to to get on there and say the only time Trump ever saw Epstein is when his chauffeur drove him past his house and he said, "Oh look, he must be having <laughs> he must be having a birthday party for some young girls. Look at all the young girls at that pool." And then he realized it was something more, so he just drove on by. I mean, this it has gone so over the top with Alex that I don't know that we can get him back to where he was, where he was really, I think, that true truther and was dishing out some truth. But I, I digress again, because the point is, you cannot ban someone on every fucking platform in a coordinated way on the same day and have that not be I mean, it's clearly a uh, collusion and it's clearly obstruction of uh, uh, obstruction of trade and he will win in the courts but it's going to come five or seven years from now when no one cares but it, it, it isn't as simple as oh those are platforms and they can do whatever they want i mean that's something that is going to have to be Hammered sure. Um, I guess I'm just viewing it tactically because uh, I'm like, I've, I've worked with these companies. Um, that was my career before I did this. I'm like, there's no way I would have, there's no way I would set up what it is I do in a way that is reliant on any of them. Because again, it's Fox and the Scorpion. I know how they behave and I know how they end up. 
So yes, there's absolutely a case. And here's, the bit that I was kind of, I got halfway through, which is I actually see this as good news and I don't mean the banning of people and so on. Every time they do this, and you're noticing it, especially with Twitter at the moment, um, the whole platform gets worse and people don't want to be there anymore. Every time they do this, they make the thing that they're trying to make safe or better worse. And it just seems like everyone's kind of working that out and either looking for a new thing or realizing that we do need to pivot towards a, um, a more decentral kind of like using platforms to connect in an analog way rather than everyone hanging out on a platform. And I, I actually see it as a kind of good news that they're, and it, it kind of shows in, in many respects how scared they are or aware they are that the kind of overarching propaganda is failing because propaganda always kind of fails before a regime change. Uh, and, and you sort of get the sense that we've got a few years left to run of these idiots making it um, so much more awful because they, they've got their marching orders from whoever, like, you know, um, wherever they come from. Uh, and I just, it's going to be crap, but I actually kind of see it as a, it, it's going to be more, slightly more difficult, and this is just how the world works, to be on the internet in a satisfactory way. But in the medium term, maybe that's good. Like maybe we will end up with ways that don't rely wholly on everyone being on a platform that is like a DARPA funded surveillance thing, right? Like, I don't know. I, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit more, yeah. No, I, I, spot on. I really like where you're going. And I think, again, that is being played out as we speak because the third meme I have up there is, you know, Joe Rogan's recent interview with Jack Dorsey at Twitter. And the news out of that is, you know, 10,000 thumbs down on YouTube because of Joe Rogan, who, if anyone who doesn't understand him, I don't want to say he's a shill because he's not. But I mean, he's just a part of that megaphone now, you know, in some way that we don't totally understand and whether he's mm. co-opted or just following the cheese that's laid down through the maze or who cares or, you know, but the, the, you know, there he is tossing softball questions to Jack Dorsey. But to your point, it's thumbs down, thumbs down, thumbs down, thumbs down to where, you know, he had to apologize to his listeners. Yeah, right. I'll do it better next time. Yeah, right. And, or YouTube should get rid of that thumbs down thing anyway. Why don't we just have likes? We don't need any dislikes, but to your point, I think those are the throws of a dying fish. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Netflix is doing it as well. I mean, they actually got rid of the rating system because Amy uh, Amy Schumer. Yeah, when her when her okay yeah when her show came out, whatever it was, eighteen months ago, um, and it was terrible uh, because they and she'd made such a big fuss about being paid the same amount as um, right. I forget who. Right. And everyone found it awful that they did what YouTube may well do, which is like, oh, well, we'll remove the negative bit. He goes, guys, this is, <laughs> this is not how you, it's almost, you could almost make a medical metaphor. I'm like, you were treating the symptoms here. And, and I don't think they have the awareness to do anything else. I don't really watch Alex Jones, so I'm not sure what he's up to or anything. Uh, I enjoy Alex Jones immensely. I have to say, uh, because he's an entertainer, he is strictly and at this point, especially, he's completely crossed over the line to we really can't take him anything uh, other than and then entertainment. And for any all, everything after his apology to James Elephantis on, it was it all is revealed. You know, why do we have to apologize to James Elephantis for Pizzagate? Why did we have to do that? Well, clearly to me, there's some kind of connection with his you know, Trump has taken that off the table. That will not be pursued. There will not be any draining of the swamp. And I think the orders came down there. And that's the thread that I follow with Alex Jones that clarifies where that the whole thing is going. But uh, enough on him. I have one more topic. I was going to see if we could, if we could get there. But in a lot of ways, I think we already have when we talked about counterfeited spirituality that seems to be strictly looking at empirical data, the data from the alien contact experience 
mainly the data that's been collected by my buddy Ray Hernandez and the free organization. They're the only ones who did a real scientific study of it, including uh, Leo Sprinkle and other PhD level, Harvard PhD level people who know how to collect that kind of data for whatever that's worth, survey empirical data. But those experiences line up almost perfectly with the near-death experience. So sure. what do you do with that data? One way to interpret that is that these are truly spiritual experiences. And I'm one person who's pounding the drum over there kind of with your demonic uh, uh, trickster kind of sensibility that you're expressing going, really? Uh, are we sure? It, it, could the technology, again, loosely using the term technology, be so developed that they can counterfeit the spiritual experience? And I wonder if you have any thoughts Absolutely. Like when, and I love Ray Hernandez's stuff as well. Um, this, uh, you know what I'm going to say, like, so if, if near death experiences or after death contact, uh, and UFO cases have some, uh, have a lot of, of structural similarities and, and after effects in people's lives. Yeah. This is that kind of naive Western idea of, well, then it, you know, well, my, my grand is in heaven and, and I spoke to an alien. So this must be good. That's really, really naive. And you know what I'm going to say? It looks like the spirit world to me. The spirit world is ambivalent. And, and we just, that's one of the things perhaps we can learn um, by doing comparison a little bit uh, better so that we don't have this binary of is it aliens or is it ghosts and are they good or are they bad? There are better ways, li literally objectively better ways of coming at this material and, and understanding that it, it has some ambival ambivalence or it might have one or more agendas. Like that's, that's how we've always interacted with these things as, as a species. That's how we've always interacted. So yeah, hundred percent I'm with you on that. I love Ray's stuff. Um, I do think on the edges of that, you do get people who are who are more optimistic about the motives for extra dimensional contact than I think we should be. Maybe this is our business background, Alex. Maybe, you know, maybe this is something like that. But I'm generally, I want to know why Shining someone is star. being nice. Yeah, I want to know why someone is being nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that is a a business value that I can definitely mm. tune into. You know, it's um, it's been awesome. We've spent gee, an hour and forty five minutes has flown by. Gordon, tell folks what's going on with Rune Soup and where the hell is the book, buddy? You, uh, yeah, there's got to be one or two of them out there. What's what's the delay? Um, the delay is I'm you know I have about three full time jobs at the moment because they have a brand new farm which is a full time job and uh, I have a premium membership because I don't use Patreon for people who like this kind of stuff we do quarterly courses the next one is on um, ancestors and uh, contact with the dead um, so you can do that at runesoup.com obviously the ma majority of it is free the show the blog and the Facebook page um, if somebody wants to take a course just a kind of d detail here someone wants to take a course. How do they pay for it? Are you open to Patreon if they want to do that? No, I don't do Patreon. Um, you like you just click on the member section of the website and, and join up. It's the same idea. Like yeah, there's a monthly fee and um, well, there's a monthly membership, but it's not just the one course. We don't sell them diff like differently. We do like the live video and people go on holidays together and all, all kinds of weird. It's, it's a it's a really fun and amazing group. Um, lunatics like me uh, but if you do, do experiments stuff, together you know, right you guys do oh yeah do experiments oh, yeah. and remarkable all. ones and i in fact credit the fact that this sixty thousand hectare bushfire got 800 meters from the farm and no further to um the repeated kind of intention exercises and and um, nakshatra mantras we did on a big simultaneous group basis and it's it's been an incredible last few weeks and if that kind of if you like um if you like exploring skeptical style content in a, in a way that is, uh, is embodied, I guess, um, it, that might be for you. It might not listen to the show anyway. <laughs> who, who are the, uh, I, I have not popped over there. I'm a member, but I've, I just haven't made the, the leap and I don't know exactly why. Cause I want to poke in there. I, I love that idea of embodying it and finding like-minded folks Who's coming over there? Give me an idea of the of the profile. I'm sure it's a wide variety of folks, but yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's a lot of sort of background interest overlaps. Magic being the principal one. These are these are magically operant people by and large, and the courses are very specifically because they vote on them. They're very specifically about magic, um, but we'll end up doing other ones uh, eventually. And so, with this fascinating overlaps with people uh, um, with either a permaculture background or a philosophy. Uh, 
the majority of them are in the US. Um, yeah, it's they're they're amazing, and the lives they get up to. Um, this is one of the things that's fun about our little world. You meet the most remarkable people. Awesome. Well, I really hope people check that out, and they're going to find me over there more because I, I really want to do that. I think what you're creating and the community that you're creating is super important. And talk about embodying it. You know, here's a guy that a couple of years ago was talking. I remember when we were talking, we were sitting out on the patio near my house and you were visualizing what you did manifest. I mean, exactly. And it was really yeah. kind of remarkable to see you go through that process. So you have a nice little apple farm and whatever else you're farming there yeah. on the edge of the world, overlooking Antarctica. And you you tell people a little bit about that project that you've, that you've undertaken there. Cause I know a lot of people really find that, it's kind of the total reframe of the prepper thing into a positive yeah. lifestyle where I want to be regardless of how good or bad things get. No, exactly. So, um, I mean, I'm a permaculture designer. I'm events officer for Permaculture Tasmania. We've only just got here, so it's in, we've only been here 12 months, so it, it still just looks like overgrazed sheep paddock um, with a few things that we've planted, right? But that is the general idea of, of to kind of live in a, in a way that is experimental um, in the sense of there are permacultures, this is a whole separate show, right? It is in a really interesting place in terms of what it does next and uh, and i'm very interested in that overlap i know dr hunter is as well i'm contrib contributing to his latest book in that kind of sense so yeah we live on um five acres in in southern tasmania um beginning a sort of permaculture journey which will include you know on-farm produce and accommodation and and all the other things and it's amazing yeah when it's not on fire it's an amazing place to be awesome well, it's been just great uh, reconnecting with you on Skeptico. I know so many people will appreciate this interview. Gordon, do take care. Let's stay in touch. And thanks again for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.